Welcome to episode 8 of Gleaner Sports Live. My name is Daniel Wheeler and thank you so much for joining us. We begin the month of July with a very special guest and I feel that it's going to be a very, very good and very impactful episode. Kimoy Campbell holds the national records in the 1500 and 5000 meters and has represented Jamaica in various events, um, in various events, the World Championships and the Olympics. Um, but he was forced to retire last, last year after he collapsed suffering a severe cardiac arrest. So we'll get to talk to him in terms, in terms of you know, what he's been doing in um, post-retirement, his career, and how life has changed for him since. Kimoy! How are you doing? Hey, man. How are you doing? How are you doing? Anyway, thank you so much for joining, joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Can't complain at all. Ex- excellent. Where, where you are now? Are you in, um, where in the U.S. exactly are you? I'm living in Miami right now. In Miami. Oh, yeah. Okay. So at least, you know, as, as, as in terms of weather, you know, nothing, di- nothing different to Jamaican weather. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I've lived in a few places here and um, obviously those weren't as nice as Miami. So at the end of the day, I'm actually glad I ended up coming to Miami. Excellent, excellent. Um, just a third word disclaimer, this, um, disclaimer, one of the persons that are in the chat, Damien Mitchell, he actually mm-hmm. went with you at the same school at Belfield, Belfield High. So he's oh, hailing you up as well. Yeah, let me see. I'm trying to read <laughs> the comments here. <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much for joining us, Kimoy. But just, um, just to kick things off just a little bit in terms of a little icebreaker, there's just, you know, four questions that I'm going to, um, I'm go- going to ask you just to kick things off. Um, first of all, um, basketball or football? Football. Football. (laughs) Um, I saw you having one of, in one of your Instagram posts that you have a picture of Deadpool. Oh, yeah, yeah. You have the Deadpool thing. So the question I want to know, DC or Marvel? Um, I'm going to say Marvel. Marvel. I like Marvel, yeah. Most have to represent, have to represent for the Spider-Man and Deadpool fans. Yeah. Well, not a huge Spider-Man fan, but Deadpool, I like Deadpool, yeah. Excellent. Um, third was your most, what is the most intimidating atmosphere that you competed in, whether that was that, you know, coming up as a, um, um, a, three, a, a long distance runner at champs or at the world championships? I'm going to say probably Olympic Games. Um, Olympic Games. Yeah, because... You know, that's a big event and um, everyone wants to make it to the Olympic Games. And at the end of the day, when I was there, being in the stadium and seeing that much people in the stadium watching um, the 5K, it was, it, was, it was overwhelming. But at the end of the day, I think it was one of those events that you will always remember. Mm-hmm. And then finally, your favorite meal that you have to have when you come home. So I'm going to go with curry goater. Curry yeah. goat is a yeah, <laughs> what a, a huge, huge, huge fan of curry goat, and I actually love patty as well. So, those two things have to get when I come home. Well, I hope that they're not in short supply, seeing that you know a lot of Jamaicans are in Miami and then there, there may be places to get them. I mean, there's some places, but there's not as um, I guess there's not a lot. There's a few that I like. Actually, the other day I found one that has good jerk chicken and um, rice and peas. And, but the thing is, they don't deliver much on Grubhub. So if I want oh, it, I have okay. to go get it. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a good place. So there's a few places that I like here. Cool. Um, well, ju- just to get right, right into it, you know, when I, you know, when I come and ask people to, you know, to come to, to come onto the show, I ask, I feel that everybody, you know, has an origin story in terms of athletes of how to get into middle, um, um, whether in terms of their specific discipline, you know, a lot of persons, you know, obviously when they think of Jamaica, they think of sprints. So what got you really into, um, into middle to long distance running and thought that this would be in terms of a good path for you? I mean, when I first started, I started sprinting at first, as any Jamaican would. They they always give that a try before they try anything else. And um, I wasn't very good at that. I would be, uh, I would come second, third all the time and against basically everyone I ran against. And then um, I played soccer for a little bit. Then I um, played cricket for a little bit. Wasn't very good at catching. (laughs) So I quit that. (laughs) Then, um, I don't know. I think from a young age, I was just good at like running longer because whenever my um, parents would send me to the shop, they always um, 
they'll always want me to go back, go there fast and get this stuff back to them. And I'll just always try to see how fast I can go to the shop and see if I can actually break my own um, times while running to the shop. And then uh, after that, I decided one sports day at school that I, I told my aunt, I want to try and see if track and field is for me. And I tried, well, tried running at sports day. I was thinking I was going to run like the short races. And my music teacher decided to tell, like, decided what the house that I'm in needed some points. So I had to uh, run the 5K. I didn't even know how much lap the 5K was. <laughs> So when I step on the um, start line and um, my my math, th- math teacher was starting the race actually, stepped on the um, start line. Um, I asked my math teacher how much laps is the five k. Told me twelve and a half. At that time, I looked at him and I was like twelve and a half. No, I'm getting off this line. I'm not running that <laughs> yeah. long. But um, he told me just give it a try, young man, and then I did it. Came third, beating some of the guys on the track team that are training for the race, like that type of race. And then it all started from there. Well, well, and, and, and considering the way that you started, you didn't think that, you know, you would keep going. You thought it was basically a one-time thing. You didn't, you didn't thought that, you know, you would keep going, you know, in terms of to make yeah. it to the, the very highest of the professional, um, of the professional discipline. That's true, because when I started, I didn't know I was going to continue doing it. Um, for me, it was, it was a one-time thing at a sports day. And then after, um, after the, my coach in Jamaica, after he decided, like, kid, you have talent, and he started work helping me um, train. And the first race I went to, I think it was in probably St. Thomas. It was a road race. And I won the um, 14 to 16 age group. That's the first race I've ever been to. And after that, I realized once you win something, you just want to keep winning. So that's why I kind of continued and continued training as hard. And then I realized now that I'm winning the 14 to, um, the 14 to 16, I want to keep winning until I'm the top runner in Jamaica. And then I just get my head on my body and just start training as hard as I could. Um, when you were com- when you were coming up, um, there wasn't. I imagine there wasn't a lot of persons that were that much interested in doing the, you know, doing the, those those sort of distances. Um, was it important for you when you when you got when you got to the um, professional level and you were running professionally? Was it um, I, I guess a greater motivation for you to do um, to do well in order to I guess bridge your path to see that you know this is a real. Um, viable option in terms of for to broaden Jamaica's portfolio um, f- um, for athletics? I mean, that's definitely after, I would say after um, I was just setting goals as as my career went on um, from high school my goal was to become the top runner in Jamaica. Uh, once I became the top runner, my goal was to get a scholarship to um, a college here. Once I um, got a scholarship to a college here, it was to get a contract. Now, once I get a contract, my main goal was to actually uh, medal for Jamaica in one of the games, like whether it be um, the World Championships or Olympic Games. If it's even a bronze or a silver medal, it wouldn't matter. But um, that was always my goal. And to me, I always wanted to be the trendsetter for people who believe that Jamaicans are Jamaicans are only sprinters because that's not true. If you put your mind to something and say, hey, this is what I want. This is what I'm wor- going to work towards. You can accomplish it like at the end of the day because it's you limit yourself. And there were a lot of times when people used to ask me like, why run such a long distance? Why do this? Why do this? I wasn't do- doing it for them. I was doing it for myself because I wasn't putting a limit on myself. I knew what I was capable of and I knew I had to work very hard to get where I wanted to be. And even though unfortunate, the unfortunate incident that happened to me that kind of cut my career short, I wouldn't look back and take anything away from my career. Mm-hmm. And, just, and I just wanted to, sort of to segue because it's been, I would say in terms of, I guess, an interesting um, year for you to say, to say the least. Um, because you had to, you, you you had to force to retire because of the um, the incidents at the Melrose Games, um, and you suffered what happened to be a cardiac cardiac arrest. Now, for those who are not 
familiar? Can you, because uh, I know that you had something posted on your Instagram in terms of what's the difference between a heart attack and also a cardiac arrest for those so, who may not be familiar. So with, um, a car- well, I guess mine was a heart failure. Um, what happened is usually with a heart failure, you have electrical complications where the electricity in your heart is disrupted and it causes your heart to either stop or go into, go into an arrhythmia. What happened in my particular case is that my heart went into an arrhythmia. The um, electrical, um, I guess, impulses was so disrupted. And once I went into the arrhythmia, my heart started beating so fast that it ended up stopping. And that's when they had to shock, shock me um, in order to get my heart rhythm back to normal or get it started because at that time my heart had stopped they had to shock me to get it started again um with a heart attack what you have is you have blockage in the arteries within the heart and what that causes it causes blood flow you restrict blood flow within the heart so then you the heart end up not getting like enough oxygen to pump properly and that causes a heart attack so and because of the um it's sort of you know kind of you know profound in terms of um because the way you've gone about this during the, during this journey because after the recovery and you're fighting in terms of to yeah. get back and realizing that you know you may be at the time that you had that you had to stop or else you know that you were going to die in that in that kind of process from february to september that you made the decision what was going into your mind in terms of at least trying to get back and realizing that you may you won't you won't be able to. I mean, so I was optimistic about like competing again, even when I was laying in the hospital bed. Um, the doctors they were telling me that there's a possibility that I won't compete again because they couldn't figure out they couldn't figure out what caused it and um, why it, like why it happened in the first place. And um, because of that, I think. I was, I was thinking that they would probably find what, what was the cause and what's wrong and how to fix it. So I was thinking I could compete again. And there were a few times when after I got out of the hospital and I started like, um, I basically started recovering and I started going on walks and started pushing myself like this day I'd go for 15 minutes. The next time I'll go for 18 minutes and I keep pushing myself until I was able to walk my, like three miles or however much. Um, then I went back to Virginia, um, and started, I did one run in particular, I remember. And I did, I, I felt all right running the three miles, but it's when I got back home, I realized that my chest didn't feel right. It was hurting. So, um, after that, I decided I'm just gonna, I'm just not gonna do it. I'm gonna go to my cardiologist, figure out what was going on, tell them what happened after the run and after that, <laughs> I remember going to them one one day and they did everything. At this point, I was just resting. I was just trying to recover as much as possible so I wouldn't further my um, situation. And then when I went to the cardiologist, I was sitting there. They did all the tests and they, they tell me, like, your heart's working at 35%, which normally a human heart, like, the ejection fraction is work is. A normal person is um, 60 to 55, I think. And um, mine was at 35. When I was in the hospital after the cardiac arrest, it was at 25. So it had improved, but still hadn't improved by much as it should. And that's when they were telling me, listen, either you decide to stop running or you might end up dying from running. So... That's when they told me, like, listen, we, we want you to just retire because you, you have to keep in mind that you could die from this. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I really can't imagine what, you know, an, an athlete that has been doing this all his life and has worked so hard to be told that because of, you know, a, because, because of, to hear those words that you have to retire. Um, in terms of the, I guess, the way that you process it out, process it in your mind although that eventually you would get to a place that you come to peace with your decision was there times that you felt angry at i um i guess at the situation 
I would say there were times, this is what I was really angry about. I would say I was angry at myself in the case that there were times when before the incident happened, I was in practice running and I would feel short, like short of breath, but I didn't think much of it. I thought like it was just an exercise in use asthma because some athletes developed that over the years. And that's what I thought was happening. But my heart, I wasn't really like, because when I went to go see um, a doctor in Charlottesville, what they told me, they couldn't differentiate if it was my lungs or my heart because the two are so, like connected and are so close together that you can't really tell. So I had to do more tests. But uh, the Monday that I had the test schedule, I went to race the Saturday. So oh, in yeah. my, yeah, so in my, like, right now, if I look back, I would probably tell myself, like, you should have done the test earlier. And maybe you would have, like, figured, run. exactly, I would have figured things out. But as I said, like, as a person, I've always been a positive person, and I try to look at the positive in my life. I, everything happened for a reason, and for me, I end up coming out of this thing alive, and um, now I can, like, tell people, hey, you, you need to, like, go out and get tests, especially athletes. You need to go out and get screening if that's the case. Um, funny enough, I was like talking to my, um, fiance and I was telling her, like, I think I know one of the, one of the driving force here to actually get people to go out and do it. When, um, when we got the bill back from the hospital and I look at how much the bill cost, if I had gone to the, um, gone to the doctors before that bill wouldn't have been that much. It would have been a le- uh, at least a month, but at the same time, like, if people don't understand how important it is to go out and get screened, maybe they need some something to show them that. And eventually I'm going to post what the bill is like to encourage some people to go out there and, and get screened. But I'm just waiting a little bit until the rest of them come and let them see that. <laughs> so, yeah, but at the end of the day, I'm sometimes the only times I feel like I'm angry is... If I see someone out there running and I'm saying like, yeah, I remember when I used to be able to go out there and run and I can't do that now. Even sometimes walking fast, maybe I have to probably be careful or whatever. But at the same time, like I, have, I, I came through with my, my life, so I can't really complain at all. Well, I, I, just, I just think that in terms of how do you deal with the fact that, you know, like if you have to be mindful of every step you take because even a simple if you jog too much or if you walk because because I, so I i i walk i walk fast you know majority of, yeah. majority of the times and i wouldn't know how to eat if i if i have to find out that you know if i walk too fast or if i jog too much at a particular speed that it could you know um cause cause issues to my heart so how do you be able to at least navigate to does it does it play mind mind games with you it definitely does um there are times when i think maybe the way I think of it is maybe I should work out. Even the doctors tell me I should work out and like make sure I'm getting my heart moving. But there are times when I do work out and then a few times like I've gotten like arrhythmias where I'm just sitting at like on the couch after some workouts. Um, well, on this particular day, I worked out in the morning. I was just sitting on the couch one night and then I started like blacking out and then my ICD in my chest had to like, hit my heart like back into rhythm and stuff. And it really does like play, um, basically like you, you start having like PTSD from it because now whenever I'm like working out, I have to be conscious, I have to constantly be watching my heart rate, trying not to get it past like a hundred and, and or something like that. But it is scary, but at the same time, like it's just my norm now and, I just have to figure out how to maneuver around doing certain things. Um, one of our viewers actually have a question that I wanted to short out because um, when because you had a you know a second scare um, in which you know you had to go back I've, in and get and, 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 yeah and, and I've get, had checked out. since then I've had four I've had four scares. Whoa. I've one I was driving. Um, on the highway in Miami, I-95. Then I started blacking out, and then my ICD had to hit me, and then I went to, um, I managed to pull over on the side of the road. 
another one i was um where was i oh yeah i was sitting on the couch here and then i got hit by the icd because i was blacking out and then another one recently so it's been it's been happening like frequently and i've obviously yeah as i said it's scary um it's a lucky it's a good thing they put the icd in but at the same time um i'm i'm glad they actually put the icd in that's all <laughs> and for those who don't are not sure about what we're talking about icd is the um can you give in terms of the the full letter for icd um it's I can't remember the full letter, but what it is is an internal defibrillator. It's a um, device that they either put um, in your heart, like, I guess not in your heart, in your chest, or they have subcutaneous device that they put under your skin. The one that I have now is a, um, uh, it's actually, I can just, like, right here. So if you okay. look right here, it's put, like, right underneath my uh, muscle here. So it doesn't show as much. And what it does is as soon as the heart rhythm gets, um, like I start having an arrhythmia, it just, boom, sends a current straight to the heart and basically feels like a horse kicked you in the chest. Oh, yeah. that does because, and you, had to, and you had to do that like four times. Yeah, I had to do that had like do that four, four times. times, yeah. But one of the questions our viewers wanted to ask because um, during the second, um, what, um, during the second, um, you know, um, incident where you had to pull over the side of the road, mm -hmm. and Sh and Shelly and and Shelly and Fraser, um, Price, um, you know, was was so was so nice to just um, boost your um, use our platform to help yeah. you with the funds for the second operation. What was it like to get to get that sort of support? Um, I mean, it from was, athletes from home. It was very good. Um, Shelly is a close friend of mine, and um, at the end of the day, like. It's always good to support other athletes because you never know what might happen. You might need support sometimes. And um, for her to do that with her following, I think it was great. Uh, obviously, it's always that you always have to think about like the financial part of it because, yes, you're getting taken care of. But at the end of the day, when you get home and all that bill starts coming in, you don't want to be too stressed out about like you having to pay that much money. And... She helped a lot by just posting the GoFundMe and um, asking people to just donate, and they helped me out a lot. And then um, the Jamaican government's also helping me out. So it's been, I'd say it's been a, 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 a tremendous pleasure knowing Shelly because as a, as a friend, I think, I think she definitely helped me out there. Um, during, and be, during this, you know, obviously previous time, it's because... Um, you've been advocating a lot in terms of for persons, to, not just athletes to get tested, but for everyone to get, um, to get, to get screened. Um, how important, just for those who may not be appreciated as much, how important it is um, for us to, for, um, for us to do these tests, especially for athletes, because I know that there's a lot of some, for, for example, for footballers, when they do a, get a routine checkup and they see these problems, they see something that could develop something very serious and they would have yeah. to be forced to retire, retire from it, but it saves their lives. So for those, you know, in the chat, how important it is in terms of for, you know, general heart screenings? I mean, general heart screening, screening is very important. Um, at the end of the day, you have to think of it as it is your life and you have to make sure you know what's going on within your body and you have to take care of what's going on with your body and take care of yourself. The only way you're going to do that is by knowing what's going on. Um, for me, I didn't know what was going on. I, I didn't know and I went and I ran like as fast as I could just to pace a race and all of a sudden my heart gave out. Um, what the people don't know that don't go and get like screened is that it doesn't just affect them when an incident like this happens. What happens is that when... I'll use myself as an example here. When you wake up in the, uh, in the hospital, or if you wake up, as I said, like in an interview with the Gleaner previously, doctors told me only 2% of people come out with brain function. And I was just lucky that I was at the army racing when they got the ICD, uh, the defibrillator to me, and a hospital was not even five minutes, three minutes walk across the road. I was just very, very lucky. And what these people don't know is when I woke up in the hospital and I looked around, 
I wasn't feeling bad for myself at the moment. When I look at how the incident had my brothers and my family members looking, that's one of the most hurtful things out of the whole thing. Because you look around and you see these people, they're going through hell because they don't know, like they're sitting there waiting for me to wake up like for two days, waiting for me to wake up. They don't know if I'm going to wake up like normal or not. They don't know if I'm going to be the same chemoy chemo that they know. So at the same time, like, it doesn't just affect you. So I would say if it, it doesn't hurt to go out and get screening and just know exactly what's happening in your body. As, as athletes as well, it's more important because we push our bodies hard every single day. Every single day, and you're just as human. I used to think of myself as a super a superhuman, obviously, because I can run that long, I can do all these things. But at the end of the day, you're a human being just the same, your heart work, just as like a normal person one does. Mm -hmm. Well, um just want to say I should put layers in the chat. Um yeah, Aisha, just thanks, that, yeah. <laughs> thanks for joining us, Jamaican Steeple Chase, Steeple Chase runner tuning in. Thank you so much for um, for tuning into the chat as well. And she and she said that she didn't even know about the two percent statistic. Yeah, it's when they told me that, and my family was around. And they told me that actually, when they were actually, we were all shocked because I was just so so lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, you said that you know you got because you, even though you, you've made peace with it, that you would definitely want to contribute you know, back to the sport, you still want to get back to the sport in some way. Um, and you're doing into coaching, co um, coaching now, coaching at yeah. Johnson and World University in, um, um, in Florida. So I guess I have to ask, you know, how, you, um, how, is, how has the, you know, coaching been for you so far? I mean, it's been a lot of fun. Um, obviously, I'm trying to learn uh, the sprint side and the other side as well. But coaching has been fun. Um, it's a learning experience because when... When I used to run, I am, I'm always the type of person who constantly push myself way beyond how I'm supposed to push myself every single day. So learning now that it, not everyone is as like I was and learning that I have to tailor um, some people's workout based on how good they are, what's, the, what's their um, strong points and what's their weak points. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun, um, and I'm learning a lot. Uh, obviously, I can't really coach right now because of the whole virus thing. Absolutely, and yeah. because I'm, like, at high risk, I have to stay in and stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like, I'm still learning a lot from coaching. And I think um, in the future, I actually want to try to coach some Jamaican to accomplish what I didn't accomplish. Because, as I said, one of my main goals was the medal for Jamaican. If I can actually help somebody in Jamaica to do that, that would be an accomplishment for me as well. Well, in terms of your well, in terms of your, your role, in terms of the few times that you managed to, to at least you know get out there and to do the training, what are the kind of things that you've learned about yourself, you know, as a as, um, as a coach, um, and what are the things that you know that you need to get 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 better, or what kind of what, what would you describe your coaching style? <laughs> so, my coaching style, I realize, is more strict. I am. Um, if I tell someone to do something and they're doing something totally different, it kind of ticks me off. But um, I guess my fiance have tried to tell tell me like, "Hey, listen, you're not you. You're used to like training with this mentality that you have to go out there and push hard every single day. They're not you. You have to learn from these people. Learn what type of workout they like. What type of like." you just have to learn from people as well as like teach them. And for me, like now it's like a learning process where I'm telling people like, Hey, this is how I used to do it. Like, what have you been doing? To if, what do you like to do or something like that? And then I'll actually decide if from, from their perspective and my perspective, I can write a, pro write a program that suits us both. Mm -hmm. And, well, and because of that, because I know that, you know, because, you know, your desire to make sure to, to build world-class athletes and because of the fact that athletics in Jamaica now, we're seeing a more, I guess, dive, diverse field where the medals are coming from. Last year, you had a lot of medals in the field um, yeah. um, at the World Championships. 
um, what would be in terms of the the impact that you would feel it that you that that you think that would have for Jamaican athletics if we finally get in terms of a world class um, to build up our our middle distance and um, and the long distance running. I mean, it takes us. <laughs> it's gonna take changing a lot of minds in Jamaica. Um, as you know, everyone thinks they're sprinters. It it has to start from that. You have to start from the ground up. You can't have a foundation. You can't. You have to build a foundation. And for and for people to understand that distance runner, a distance runner is not like someone who is lazy because. Whenever, like, people ask me, how did I get where I got? I basically had to get up um, from college days, five in the morning, do my run, did my run before school. Then um, after um, classes, head back to the track again, do another eight miles run. So at the end of the day, like, it's, you can't be a lazy distance runner. If you're a lazy distance runner, you're not going to get anywhere. And... Jamaicans have this tendency to want to be sprinters because it's fast money. It doesn't matter. If you're not good, there's no money. So you might as well try something else and see where it takes you. Because for me, like, I was always, from when I was younger, I was always looking at it that way. Like, oh, I could be a sprinter because I'm fast for my primary school. I'm people tell me I'm fast in my community. But how far fast are you compared to when you go outside your community? There's guys out there who are running like 10 2 and at, at champs even faster than that. I wasn't as fast as them. But that didn't mean I wasn't talented. I was talented in another area in the sport, but I just didn't realize that because I didn't try. And that's so. That's how it is. People have to try to see what they're good at, and once they figure out that, hey, this is something that I could be good at, they just have to work hard. That's all. It, that's what got me where I uh, am today. Just working hard. Mm-hmm. Well, so, huh? well, well, some, somebody just made out a comment, and then he made me an omelet before the second run. <laughs> I think that was from Rajkes. <laughs> yeah, she's. Yeah, she's. Yeah, she's funny. I guess, <laughs> but um, if if, if, any, if any sense in terms of the current state of I guess middle distance running now, um, <laughs> what do you in terms of make of it, and how in terms of I guess to change to change the mentality because it all comes about in terms of men's, I guess the mentality and maybe support. I think, I think most of these people who are in the sport now need mentors because, for instance, when. The reason why I got where I got is because people here who have done most of the work, who have competed well, um, have been mentors to me, have like talked to me and told me how they got to where they got. And as I said, my Instagram um, direct message is always open. And you can ask anybody who has messaged me about the sport. If you've messaged me about the sport and how like training, Anybody can tell you that I've, give the, I've given them advice. And it's because at the end of the day, like if I see a fellow distance runner in Jamaica trying to make something of themselves, I'm definitely going to try to help them because what, I don't want to be the only distance runner who can claim that I went to like world, if it, like world games and competed here. No, I want to see other people doing that. I'm not selfish enough to say, hey, like, no, I'm the only one who's supposed to do that now. And I think, yes, you have to have some support in it, but you also have to have people who are willing to work first, bef- then the support will come. Because if you're working hard enough and people are seeing you're working hard enough, then at the end of the day, if you ask me, if they ask, ask me for help and because you need a shoes and I can send a shoes to you in Jamaica bec- and I see that you're working super hard, I'm going to do that. I'm not, not going to let you sit there and your talent go to waste. Not even your, not even your talent, your hard work go to waste. There's no way. It's just all, of, I think it starts with the mentality up here first. And then once you find yourself working hard and getting somewhere, then a lot of help will come along the way. Yes, people will say, <laughs> people are bandwagonists. They just know you when you're doing well. But if you're not doing well, how are people going to notice what's happening? That's just how it is. 
I wanted to, in terms of to segue, um, to segue in terms of you know, um, you you know as um as a runner because you know, it's been a gradual um um rise for you because you went went to champs, broke it um, um broke the three thousand meter record a record that still stands. <laughs> Uh, still stands today and gone on to um, to break multiple national records in the fifteen hundred and, and the five thousand. But I wanted to know from you: Do you, th because you know this desire for you in order to, to build the middle distance, um, the middle distance and long running class for Jamaicans, do you feel that that champs record is going to be broken anytime in the near future? I I hope it will be broken. Um, that's one of the things I was always looking out for. Whenever I watch champs, I'm looking out for someone to break it because. If someone breaks it, that means there's a promise of another, another distance runner for Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like thinking there should be one more because, of, yes, my career was cut short, but that doesn't mean someone else can't come and take up, to, um, take up the torch from where I dropped it. Because mm -hmm. being, a, being a distance runner, as you know, like in Jamaica, yes, a lot of people know you. Yes, a lot of people want to see you um, succeed. Um, a lot of people sometimes don't believe that you're going to reach anywhere with the distance running. But that's how it is. Like, as long as you have your body on your head and decide that's where you want to go, that's the route that you want to take. I believe that if starting from chumps, as I said, if you put the work in, you will definitely break that record. And if you break that record, I'll be a happy man because I know that someone else is there to take up my um take up the torch from me and it might even go further. I would only thing I'd suggest to them is just make sure while they're doing it and they're running pro or whatever, get their screening. <laughs> That's the only thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well I'm I'm not, I'm not sure. Well maybe at the time that you weren't weren't kind of aware. But when you broke that three thousand um three thousand meter record, did you realize exactly that in terms of I guess the prevalence of where it, where it, where it, where it would take you at the time because of the lack of because of the lack of distance um long distance running that we've I, had? I mean, I'll tell you this for sure. When I was training with Dean Tomlin in Belfield, the way we trained was to break records. That's the Obviously, like, on the track team, like, I was the best one on the track team at the time. So the only way I could train was race against the time, race against the time, race against the time. And that was a huge part of the whole thing because at the end of the day, like, yes, there wasn't, like, a tons of competition in Jamaica. There were people who were good. Um, there were people who were trying their best, and, like, I commend them for that. Um, but at that time, I just think I was training so hard in Belfield that I just got to the point where I was just getting um, much better than most people. And for me, just heading into races, I was just confident because of the amount of work that I was putting in. So, um, yes, I didn't know if I was going to break like the 3K record. I didn't know if I was going to win like the 3K at Penns. I didn't know I was going to break the 5,000 record at Champs. I didn't know I was going to break these records. But heading into those races, my intention was to break the records. Mm -hmm. um, this is a bit of a, 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 bit of a, um, a, a segue here, but um, you're, living, you're living in the U.S. At, um, and at the time where um, there's a lot of more prevalent calls for social change. And I remember that, you know, during in terms of your, um, your second scare, there was a moment that I um, that I read that you know um, for the Black Lives Matter movement that you were kind of um, had a very bit of concern because if you um, were to experience something like um, um, in terms of an unlawful awful arrest and you got shocked with a taser that that could have massive effects you, you know were on, on your on your heart and I want to know though from you how has how has the recent cries for social justice you know affected you not just from you know from the from the medical side but also um as seeing in terms of more and prevalent calls for change that hopefully that and more i see more concrete you know calls for change i mean it's a huge movement here and um, obviously we've seen injustice like all over the country and it's it's been tough because at the end of the day like 
I'm a I'm a black man in the um, United States and I could just go out and something happens. Um, one of the reasons why we were like, me and my fiance was concerned is because we had seen an incident where a guy with um, heart issues got tased and his heart stopped because they tased him. And for me, I think the ICD in my chest is to help me prevent arrhythmias. So I don't know if if they add electricity to me, like my body, if it's going to affect like my ICD and prevent that from working, then send my heart into like some dangerous rhythm and kill me. So it kind of just like, when, when I saw what happened to that guy, it kind of just um, came to my mind that like, hey, that same day when I was driving and my incident happened and I pulled over, I saw a, uh, a few cops drove by and... When I saw them drive by, in my head, I started thinking like, oh, all these things have been happening to black, like black men here. And they've been getting shot just but because a cop, they might have pulled over. A cop came and like decide because I'm in the car sweating from being nervous from my um, arrhythmia. And it's so hot outside. I'm sweating. I'm scared. Like, I'm, like every, all these things are going wrong. And they might see me and think, hey, is this guy on drugs or is he high or something? And so all these things started coming to my mind and it was very scary at the moment. Like I was just thankful that when I saw, when I saw the um, fire rescue coming, I was kind of happy that like it was fire rescue that was coming. It wasn't the cops that were coming. So um, it, yeah, it's very scary living here. It's, it, people think like it's, yeah, America is, like a great place sometimes. Yes, it is. I'm not saying it's a bad country. Like I love it here, but at the same time, like there's so much things going on right now that you just have to be extra careful. Do you think? Do you th because because hearing that and people may not recognize that that's a real fear because not only that you have to worry about, you know, your health, but there are so many factors going going in with which which emphasize in terms of you know, the real fear that black um that, that black men have. Um, living in living in the U U.S. or living in everywhere else, that they feel the my um feel as a minority. Um, do you feel that, for at least no? Do you feel that there are certain what's what's different about this um this period of of of, of protests rather than the last one for um for other you know men and women that have been unlawfully killed? I mean, this is what I would say. A lot a lot more people have um have been out protesting now because we've seen we've seen the incident that happened that sparked the whole protest and i don't think any human in their right mind would like should think this was a just thing that the cop did so for me yeah i really i'm a person who doesn't like politics like i really don't but at the same time like I just think injustice is injustice and like people have to call it out for what it is. And um, I just think like a lot of people here are starting to see that this is something that's serious and it's something that they have to take into account now. Uh, Kimoy, well, um, just guys remember, you know, any questions that you have for Kimoy, please make sure that you get, get them in. We're on the back end of the, um, of the interview for only about a um, few t 10 or 11, 12 minutes to go. But um, you mentioned in terms of, you know, um, many times you're your fiance and, and she's been in terms of, you know, your rock um, through, um, 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 through, through the, you know, a period of your life that, you yeah. know, you thought that you were going to die to now. Um, what, is, what has been in terms of the most, you know, I guess most comforting, comforting thing to have, have her with you during the whole incident and, through, and, 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 yeah. and, and especially now going into the second chapter? you know of your life let me put it this way um the third incident that i had that i was sitting on the couch like we were playing video games and this was um yeah um so we were playing <laughs> we were playing video games and all of a sudden like i started feeling strange and i said to her hey i don't see the well. And I could see the, like, fear in her eyes. And she, 
she was scared, obviously. I was kind of scared because it, that's the first time. Well, I guess that's the first time it has happened, like me just sitting down, not doing anything. Um, when it happened, after it happened, I was shaking like a leaf. The apartment was warm, but I was freezing cold because I was so, um, I was just so nervous. So I was like freezing cold. And she was sitting there telling me like, hey, I wasn't breathing properly. She was saying, hey, look into my eyes. Just look at me. Like breathe. And she was telling me all these things. And that's, that's, that just solidified that, hey, this is the right person I'm spending the rest of my life with. Like she really do care about me. And like I really do care about her. And um, she's been, as you said, she's been a rock the whole time. And she's helped me to get through this. Like if I didn't have her, I don't know how I'd get through most of this. So yes, Rach, I'm thankful for you. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 th I think, for, I think if there was an R button on our chat, the R button, <laughs> <laughs> the R button will probably be pressed now. <laughs> uh, I mean, you talked, I mean, you talked about, you know, we're actually, you know, <laughs> you know, in the, in the, in the time of COVID, you know, not being able to, you being able to stand, have mm -hmm. to stay inside because, you know, you're at one of the, you know, at risk persons, but as, as athletes, as in try to get back to competition, if you if you were you know um, still able to compete, um, given in terms of the new schedule um, that the IWF um, has, has put out for provisional meets, would you a would you feel comfortable in participating in meets? Uh, what are the and what are the kind of things I guess that you would want to see to make sure that you are comfortable? Um. That's a very interesting question. I really don't know. It's been, it's been kind of tough. Give me one second. Give me one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Give me one and make second. Sure, make sure you guys get your questions. Make sure you guys get your questions in. We only have 10 minutes. So if any questions that you guys have, now is the time. Sorry, hey, Rach. Hi. <laughs> well, apparently, well, apparently, Kim White Boy came and came came and left. Um, he just got well, a little well, hot, so he's just moving around. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, what we what well, we wanted um to at least get you know get his thoughts us because actually you did um swimming as um swim, swimming as well as, as I can as I can imagine imagine it. But yeah. um in terms of what I wanted to get from you as well as a competitor, would you would you feel safe in terms of during COVID? Um, in terms of competing or what would be the kind of things that um, you would have to see um, to, to make sure that you feel safe? I don't know. I just feel like, especially in Florida, the numbers are really high. Um, swimming, I just feel like would be, it could be good or could be bad because I don't know if the chlorine's going to clean the pool out or going to spread around more germs. I guess it depends on the pool. Um, I just think, if it's a sport that you can practice social distancing and um, just not be around people as much, maybe it's okay. But, and I think in running, you could do that, especially distance. If you just um, go for a run outside and stuff like that. But, and yes, for everyone asking, he's okay. He just, he's been talking a while. So he gets kind of hot. And so he's just uh, walking around in the air conditioning right now. So I figured I would take over for the time being. <laughs> just, for, okay. just, just, for, just at least for a little bit. Uh, well, well, just, just as we have you on now, at least just quickly, um, how, how did you, how did, how did you meet um, 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 Kemoy and how has it in terms of, I guess, the um, relationships has, has, has built since, because, you know, you two are competitors. You, you guys have been competing um, you know, in your respective disciplines, how you guys met? Yeah, so we met um, in 2012 in my first year at Arkansas and Kamoy's first year as well. And I was a freshman. He was technically a junior. And I was coming back from morning practice with, like, ice bags on my knees and my shoulders. And in the cafeteria, they had, like, a line where the guy was making eggs. And so I went to go stand in the line, but I was in a hurry. And this um this skinny guy was in front of me and he said he started to talk to me and I was kind of rude and a little sassy to him um but as Kamoy tells it he just wanted someone to sit with that morning because 
like no one likes to sit alone and all the athletes kind of sat with each other. So we always talk about the egg line that that's how we met. Um, we became friends like for a while after he would always invite me over and cook me some baked chicken and rice and peas and all that good stuff. Um, and then about a year later, we officially started dating. So this year we'll be dating six years and I'll have known him for eight years. So it's pretty long. We've definitely been through a lot of stuff together, but Kamoy's a pretty amazing and positive person. And I'm lucky to know him and have gone through a lot of his journey with him. I'm so proud of him and who he has as a person. He definitely makes me want to be the best person that I can be and supports me in everything that I do. So I'm lucky to have him. Hence, hence, oh, well, hence, hence the eggs jokes. Now that I, now, <laughs> yeah, now, now, the, now the link is clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Kevoy, Kevoy is actually here. Well, glad, yes, glad, glad thanks for back. letting I, me uh, crash the party, everyone. Well, that, well, 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 we appreciate you in terms of you crashing the party. Well, someone said that Kenroy, that that Kevoy is in the is the chef in the relationship. Actually, we both are. On Sundays, we usually try to make a Jamaican dinner. My favorite is brown stew chicken. Um, Kevoy is really great at making flitters, and he made festival the other day. The only thing I really miss are patties, but I don't think we really know how to make those. We'll just have to go. Which one is our favorite? I don't remember if we like tasty or tasty juicy beef. beef better, but they're both really good and I miss them a lot. Yeah, cheese patty. <laughs> Well, so, well, well, this is definitely not uh, <laughs> definitely a good a, a good time to at least crash the party and see. Apparently, yeah, Kimoy. You're doing, he he Kimoy, definitely wants to get back work. in it, but it was really nice doing, to meet you. <laughs> no, well, nice to meet you, Rachel, and thank you for, for for at least you know crash crashing the life for at least a little bit. No problem. I'm pretty sure the viewers would love, love to meet you, and all the best. You too. Be safe. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, this is the first. This is the first in Glena Sports Life history to crash. Um, so, um, you know, some be outside crashing the line. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was about to say in terms of the test, the test of how how good is she? You know, speaking on speaking patois. Not very good. Not very <laughs> good. I try to teach her sometimes, but obviously, she only knows some things. <laughs> Well, 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 you know, we kind of at least we're on the back end winding down. But just quickly, in terms of, you know, as in, you know, as an athlete, would you be, would you at least be, you know, um, hesitant in terms of, you know, competing in COVID? I think I would. Um, there's a lot of complications when you do get COVID, from what I've been reading. So for athletes out there, um, I'd say a similar thing kind of happened to me when. Before my incident, I kind of got sick from the uh, flu, and then this happened. So I think for them, like they kind of have to be extremely careful because this is not something they want to play around with. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like in terms of protocols, because they're talking about in terms of testing and whatever, and I guess so, and also in terms of for for vaccines, do you feel that? Do you feel that you know that you would be if you were competing? Would you be in terms of susceptible to a fact to a vaccine before you compete? Um, that would be it for me because obviously, like, we don't know how long this thing's gonna be around. We don't know how it affects athletes. Um, so I think that's just something that like I would, I would be waiting on if I was competing. So at least just have to be careful and figure out what's like. What's really gonna like what they they have to take themselves into account, and you can always compete, but you can't always like compete if you're in the hospital from COVID. So you have to think about that. I know money is an issue, and your company is forcing you to like like reducing you and all that type of stuff. But at the same time, like you just kind of have to um make sure you look out for yourself first. Well, well, you know, Kemoy, this has been, you know, really fun and really engaging. And, you know, um, shameless plug, you know, got to meet, you know, the wonderful, la wonderful lady in your life. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's not a lot. We've, we've done eight episodes of this. This is the first time that, you know, somebody has crashed a, that, that has crashed a life. Uh, but definitely, but definitely teamwork. a very wo wonderful person to crash the life. Yeah, definitely teamwork. I was getting kind of hot. When I get hot, yeah. I kind of get nervous because that's what, 
it usually starts start as I get hot and then like I kind of like black out and then get hit by the ICD. So I had to kind of get up and just go get some air. So and she took mm-hmm. over. So that's ba- that basically shows you how our relationship is. She's always there for me in every way. So yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work. That's true. That's <laughs> exactly. True. Yeah. Kemoi, thank you so much. This has been, you know, fun, really illuminating and really inspiring. All the best to you. All the best to Rachel. Congrats on six years. And thank all you so the much. best, all the best, all the best. And I'm looking forward to seeing you what you do for, for coaching. And as well, hopefully in the near future, coaching up one of, um, one of, one of our, you know, future middle to long distance runners. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks a lot, Kemoi. See you soon. Right, bye. And thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been really fun and really illuminating. Remember, the YouTube, the, the, the conversation for this will be up on YouTube most likely tomorrow. So make sure you like the video, subscribe to our, our, our YouTube channel. Also make sure that you like, like and follow our page on Instagram to receive notifications on our updates for more guests. We should have a very, very, very good guest next week, Thursday. From everyone um, on the production team, my name is Danny Wheeler. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Greenest Sports Live. Cheers.